the horror I experienced in that room transcended time, space, and reason. I will never forget those words. Zach Handley reached out to me two months ago from a throwaway email address claiming to be the sole victim of Dr. Faust's horrific study of 2014. This is an experiment you have never heard of, and probably never would have if it wasn't for Zach's bravery and willingness to seek me out. It was around 9am when I arrived at the doorstep of Zach's small town home. I immediately noticed the camera mounted to an awning and several security signs staked along the walkway. I knocked and waited for a few moments as the dull humming of a security camera adjusted. The sound of several locks unbolting soon followed. The door creaked open a few inches and I recited the password that Zach and I had discussed over email. After a moment of hesitation, Zach invited me into the darkness of his small home. I observed my surroundings and quickly learned that he was a recluse. The small living space was cluttered with empty takeout containers, beer cans, and miscellaneous possessions. The air was pungent with the smell of stale garbage and burnt weed. Despite having a bedroom, Zach's bed had been moved to the centre of the living room. Even stranger, all of the internal doors had been taken off of their hinges. As I sat on the couch, Zach plopped down on the edge of his mattress. He was thin, very thin. His pale skin seemed to glow in the darkness of his living space, contrasted only by shadows and the dark circles that painted his green eyes. Zach's face was unshaven, and his shaggy hair hung well past his shoulders. I cleared the paper bags from my cushion and placed my recorder on the coffee table before speaking. As you already know, my name is John. I don't want you to feel intimidated by the recorder. I simply use it as a tool for compiling my personal notes. We can edit out anything you do not like when we're finished. Zach looked down to grab a glass pipe from the table and began to pack it with cannabis. It's all good, man. I trust you. I've read your other cases and stuff. I know you help people, like me. I attempted to smile with sympathy. I like to think I can provide victims with a sense of closure and help those who have unexpectedly dealt with traumatic and unexplainable experiences. I clicked on the recorder as Zach placed the pipe to his lips and ignited his lighter. We can begin whenever you're ready. Zach exhaled the smoke and extended his arm to Arthur. I declined. Where should I, like, start? He asked. The air conditioning kicked on, and I noticed Zach flinch before I responded. We can start wherever you like. Why don't you tell me what led you to being involved with Dr. Faust's study? Zach took another hit. Well, I went to university from 2010 to 2014. I was doing alright in my classes, except for abnormal psych. I thought it would be an easy A, but the professor was tough, and she ducked my grade every time I missed class. What was the professor's name? I asked. Kimball or Campbell, something like that. I jotted down Kimball slash Campbell in my notebook. Do you think she had anything to do with what happened to you? Zach shook his head. No, not at all. I leaned in. How did you become associated with Dr. Faust? Zack's leg began to move up and down with anxiety as he spoke. Like I said, I wasn't doing well in class. The School of Psychology offered extra credit for any student willing to do studies grad students put together. All you had to do was check the bulletin board and show up. <laughs> Dude, I did as many as I could. I scribbled in my notepad as I responded. What kind of studies were they? Zack took another hit from his pipe. They were pretty goddamn unoriginal, to be honest. Usually some sort of rendition of Pavlov, Schrodinger, or Milgram. Some were pretty cool, though. 
especially the ones where you got drunk and they asked you questions to see how long it would take for you to mess up. I couldn't help but laugh. So, Zach, you did all of these studies, but you were still failing the class? He nodded. Like I said, Kimball or Campbell or whatever was strict. I still needed about 50 overall points to be okay, and most studies offered between 5 and 10. I was running out of time. Zack sighed and looked down. It was Friday after class when I found a letter at my doorstep. It had the university logo on it and everything. It looked super legit. It was the letter from Dr. Faust. I leaned in with interest. What did it say? Zack's leg fidgeted furiously. Something along the lines of, The psychology department is very pleased with your frequent participation. Dr. Faust cordially invites you to an exclusive study that will guarantee a full letter grade increase for this semester. Zack's eyes began to twitch. It went on to tell me that my involvement must be confidential, as the study was per invite only. I didn't even question it. Where did the letter tell you to go? I asked. Zack stared into my eyes. The basement level of DeMarco Hall, room B7. I'll never forget that room, John. And that's why the police haven't taken me seriously. There is no basement at DeMarco Hall, and no room B7. But I swear to God, there was on that day. Zack turned and wiped the tears that were beginning to well in his eyes. I remember hitting the button on the old elevator and everything. Lower level. Room B7 was at the end of the hall. I quickly scribbled in my notepad and looked back up at him and asked, What did the room look like? Zack looked around nervously and lowered his voice as if he was in fear of being overheard. It looked normal, just like any other basement classroom. White brick walls and tile floors. I was the only person there. The room was empty except for a chair, small table, and an old computer in the middle of the room. The table had a note in it that said, Zack, please click the mouse to begin the study. Were you concerned at this point? I asked. Zack was looking back at the floor. Not at all. Not until the test began. I clicked the mouse and the computer lit up. The screen said, Find the mistakes in these photos as quickly as you can. I'd done this kind of test before. Kind of like that photo hunt game. The first photo showed the night sky, but there were two moons. I clicked on one of the moons, and it showed the next picture. This one was of a bowl of fruit, but the pear was red instead of green. I clicked the pear, and then it went to the next picture. His eyes welled up again, and he choked on his words. What was the next picture, Zack? I asked. It's okay. No, it wasn't okay. The next photo was of my family on vacation at Disney World, outside of the Magic Kingdom. Me, my mom and dad, and my little brother, Thomas. Tears were streaming down his face. You know what was wrong with the photo, John? I shook my head. Thomas, my little brother, he wasn't on that trip. That was the vacation we took two years after he died, back when we tried to remain a normal family. But there he was in the photo, standing right next to me, with the biggest smile you've ever seen. My stomach felt uneasy as Zack continued. I got up and backed away from the computer. My mind was racing. I felt sick, confused, and I was furious. I went to the door and it wouldn't budge. I yelled and kicked it as hard as I could. Nothing. I tried my cell phone, but it was useless. No signal at all in the place. Not only that, but my phone wouldn't even respond. It was completely frozen. I went back to the computer to see if it had any internet access. The photo was still up with Thomas, staring at me with that huge smile. I couldn't get it off that screen. As much as I didn't want to admit it, I had to continue. 
I moved the mouse to click on Thomas, and nearly puked. His skin had begun to turn grey in the photo, and his eyes black, as if he was rotting. The smile on his face grew larger. I clicked on him, and it went on to the next picture. Zack buried his face in his hands as he continued. The next showed a photo of my father's funeral. He took his own life a few years after losing Thomas. I felt my own eyes tearing up. I'm so sorry, Zack. He ignored my sympathy and continued. Everyone was standing in black as I lowered his casket into the ground. It looked like the photo had been taken from the nearby woods and zoomed in. I lost it at this point. I picked up the computer and smashed it on the ground. I've never been so mad in my entire life. I turned around to go back to the door. Zack paused. This is where no one believes me. The door wasn't there. It was just more white brick wall. I was trapped. My head started to spin. My heart was beating out of my chest. I turned back around and there was the computer. Back on the table in one piece with a funeral image back on the screen. At this point my brain tried to comprehend the situation. I thought that I was having a super realistic dream or something. I started slapping my face to try and wake up. But I never did. I was losing it. I sat against the wall of the classroom for probably two or three hours, trying to get a grip on reality. Eventually, I submitted to the voice in the back of my head. I had to finish the test. Zack sighed and continued. I went back to the photo to see what was wrong, so I could click it and continue. I looked at all of the people, dressed in black and standing around the grave. I saw so many familiar faces, family and friends. After a few moments, I saw it. I was ashamed I hadn't noticed it. It was my own face. My face in the photo. I was laughing hysterically, looking at the casket. I felt like I was going to puke again. I can swear to you that nobody laughed that day. I put the mouse over my face to click. And just before I did, it moved and stared directly at me through the screen. Tears were streaming down his cheek again. The moment I clicked, all of the lights went out in the room. I heard the floor creak and felt something behind me. I was too scared to move. It was like I was paralyzed. I just wanted it to be over. For a second, I felt cold air breathing down my neck. Zack excused himself to wipe his eyes and nose. What happened then? I asked. The lights came back on, but the room had changed, he whispered. I looked at him, curiously. Changed? How? Zack continued. Like, completely changed. It wasn't the same room anymore. More like a... A hallway, but really narrow. Too narrow. I've never done well with tight spaces. I was still in the chair, but the computer and table were gone. I realized then that I wasn't alone. The hallway smelled like death and rot. It was so bad I choked on it. The light behind me was disappearing, like the shadows and smells were creeping towards me. There was something in that darkness, John. I heard it's wet crackling footsteps on the floor. I had no choice but to move forward. I started to run. The hallway twisted and turned like a maze and became narrower as I pushed on. I've come to the realization that I was being treated like a lab rat, but instead of searching for a reward, I was avoiding a punishment. Eventually the space was too narrow. The footsteps behind me grew louder. The only choice I had was to push through the narrow gap towards the cool air. I inched forward with all of my strength and tried to ignore the pain and eventually breached through. The space was just large enough, like it had been built for me. Whatever that thing was behind me sunk its finger into my leg 
before I made it to the room on the other side of the wall. What was on the other side? I asked. Zach continued. It was a large sewer line on the edge of campus. I ended up finding a ladder and climbed out. You know the rest. I jotted a few notes. And what of the investigation and Dr. Faust? Zach looked me in the eyes. The only record of a Dr. Faust was in 1919. He was fired and arrested when police discovered a makeshift lab under his home that he was using to torture students. He died in prison. There wasn't much of an investigation. I lost the original letter, and there's no evidence of any basement in DeMarco Hall. The only thing they can't figure out was the timing. What do you mean? I asked. My roommate reported me missing pretty quickly. Three weeks had passed by the time I climbed out of that sewer. I hadn't eaten, drank or slept. The horror I experienced in that room transcended time, space and reason. Zach looked back down to the floor. I'd like to end the interview now. And so I did. Zach and I parted ways. I listened to our conversation during my drive home. By the end, I was skeptical of his entire story. That was, until I went to walk to my own front door. I hadn't given Zach or the university my information. But, sitting on my doorstep was a letter from Dr. Faust inviting me to participate in his next study. A new patient? I asked my secretary, slightly outraged. Please, sir, she tried to plead with me. You have to. I am completely overbooked as it is. I simply cannot take anyone else. But she's my cousin, she said as she stood up from the front desk. That doesn't mean anything, I tried to explain. I cannot make exceptions with things like this. Dr. Martin, the secretary raised the voice a little louder than usual. I looked at her with one curious cocked eyebrow. The secretary realized the mistake and lowered her voice back down. She needs it. She needs you. I was prepared to reject the proposition again, but I saw that hopeless, desperate look in her eyes. She couldn't bear to take any answer other than yes. Fine, I finally submitted to my strange gut feeling. She was nearly jumping for joy upon hearing the news. Thank you so much, doctor. She quickly sat back down in a rolling office chair and began frantically typing on her computer. I'll tell her right now. All right. I began to make my way back to my office. Just let me know when you schedule a first appointment. My secretary meekly looked up from her computer. Oh, she already has one set for today. I stopped and quickly ran back over to her desk. Excuse me? She has an appointment set for three o'clock this afternoon. She tried to not be frightened by my slowly growing impatience. You mean to tell me that you scheduled an appointment for someone who wasn't even a patient yet? I tried to keep calm, but my anger was practically bursting out of my ears. My secretary didn't flinch. She stared directly at me and then turned back to her computer and repeated, She needs you. I sighed heavily and walked back to my office, defeated. I hate when she does stuff like that. At three in the afternoon that day, after finishing up with another patient, my secretary peeked into my office and told me that Phoebe, using a different name for privacy reasons and out of respect, was ready to come in. Who? I asked. The woman I told you about this morning, my cousin. I tried to roll my eyes in the most inconspicuous way possible. Then I said to let her in. 
I sat back in my chair, lazily waiting. The door to my office opened up, and in walked a middle-aged woman with beautiful long black hair. She looked about late thirties and seemed very reserved and shy. You must be Phoebe, I spoke as I began to examine the woman's demeanor. I tried to seem at least a little interested. After all, she was my patient. Yes, and thank you for taking me on such short notice. I know how busy you are. Phoebe approached my desk and confidently outstretched her hand. I leaned forward and shook her hand in return. It's no trouble, I assured. I motioned for her to sit in one of the many chairs around the room. Once she was comfortably seated, I began the session. So, first of all, what brings you here today? Phoebe shuffled a bit in her seat. She was clearly uncomfortable about answering. Ma'am? I gently prodded. Phoebe took in a deep breath. My daughter has this sort of friend, I guess you could call it. Go on. I began to feel genuinely intrigued. Well, she was beginning to sound a bit more comfortable, but she was still holding back. You see, this friend isn't actually there. I mean, she plays with him all the time, but I can only see her playing by herself. She'll play in the backyard for hours, and it always looks like she's talking to someone. All the little games she plays are meant to be played with two people. Then, when she comes inside, she'll talk about Mr. Whisper. She and him are becoming such good friends, but there's never anyone there. I'm getting a little scared. Ma'am, I did my best to sound professional when saying this. It sounds like your daughter made up an imaginary friend. It's very common for little children to create a friend of their own to play with. I know about imaginary friends, sir, she continued, but I think this is something else. Every time she talks about Mr. Whisper, I get this very uncomfortable feeling. I can't really describe it, but it's kind of like I'm in a submarine and the pressure is imploding in on me from all sides and I have a hard time breathing and... Phoebe began to grow noticeably dizzy and fell off of her chair. I ran over to her and helped her regain her balance. Are you alright? I asked. Yeah, sorry. I guess I've just been a little stressed lately. Her voice sounded slightly breathy. I walked over to the water cooler and got Phoebe a cup of water. Ma'am, I started. I want to help you, but I don't know how any of this could be possible. I took the cup over to her to drink. It doesn't seem right. Listen. Phoebe knew she wasn't being fully heard, so she tried one last time. My daughter is in some sort of danger. I don't know how to prove it yet, but I can feel it. Phoebe, I'll tell you something. I tried to reason. Go home and relax for a bit. Take a nice long nap if you have to. I began walking over to my office door, implying that it was time for her to leave. If you feel these feelings again or anything new happens, give me a call, but I'm guessing that it's nothing more than a simple childhood imaginary friend. I opened the door and turned towards Phoebe again. She slowly got up out of a chair and walked over to the door. An imaginary friend is only real in your mind. Mr. Whisper is actually real. I know it. Phoebe walked out of the office without even saying hello to her cousin on the way out. I felt bad about letting someone leave who was clearly in need of some sort of help, but there was nothing I could do. A few days later, I was on my lunch break and my secretary told me I had a call waiting on line one. I dismissed her before answering it. I wasn't too surprised with the voice I heard. Doctor? Asked the voice. It was Phoebe, only 
she sounded more anxious, more paranoid. I could tell just by listening to that one word that something had happened. Is everything all right, ma'am? I asked, truly concerned. I could sense Phoebe gathering all her thoughts before she spoke. I heard a slight breath in on the line. I know you think I'm talking nonsense, she began, but you have to at least try to believe me. She waited for a response, but I was waiting for her to speak, so she went on. I can sense him all around me now. At first, I would just get that weird feeling whenever my daughter talked about him, but then I started getting it when I saw her playing with him. I could tell the difference between when she was playing alone and when she was playing with Mr. Whisper. She would act differently. I don't know how else to say it. Anyway, I started to get an odd feeling that my daughter was getting stressed out by something as well. She seemed off every now and then, but my daughter has always been the kind of child who doesn't want to show her weaknesses, so she never admitted anything to me. Then one day, my daughter told me she and Mr. Whisper had gotten into a little argument and that she wasn't going to play with him for a little while. I did what I needed to do and pretended to be upset, all that stuff. So, she started playing with me a bit more. I didn't force her to at all. She just came to me and wanted to play together. I didn't complain at all. But then, one day, I noticed she had a few red scratches on her back and on her arm. Now, she had played outside on the playgrounds a few times recently, so I quickly assumed it had something to do with that, so I didn't ask her. However, a few days after that, I saw her playing outside again, except I had that really funny feeling again. I knew she was playing with Mr. Whisper again, but she didn't seem to be herself. She looked a little scared. When she came in for dinner that night, I could tell something was different about her. I told her I noticed she was playing with Mr. Whisper again, and she looked up at me with a pained expression. I had never seen her make that face before, but she quickly put on a fake smile and said, Yeah, we got into a fight before, but now everything's alright. I told her I was proud of her for being a big girl, but I was so scared. From that day on, I noticed something happening. This sounds awful to say, but I started getting that horrible feeling whenever I was around my daughter. I would see her walk through the house and I would begin to feel faint and every day it would get worse. I could see it on my daughter's face too. She was getting more scared every time I saw her. That's when I began to notice Mr. Whisper was starting to latch himself onto my daughter. I called you as soon as I figured it out. I sat with a phone against my ear and a dumbfounded look upon my face. I didn't know what approach to go for, so I just began talking and hoped something good would come out. Ma'am, I've never experienced anything like this. It's very hard to tell exactly what we're dealing with here. If what you're saying is true, we could possibly be dealing with a supernatural entity here. And if that's the case, I'm in no position to help you. No, Phoebe exclaimed, startling me for a moment. There's no time to go to someone else. I'm afraid of what'll happen if we waste too much time. My mind raced as I attempted to come up with a solution. How about this? I prompted. I will come see you after work and we can discuss in person what the best solution would be. The other line went silent for a moment. All right, Phoebe answered. Her voice showed that she wasn't completely satisfied, but it would work for now. If you send me your address, I will meet you there as soon as I get off of work, I added. Phoebe told me the address and we talked a bit about the details before I said I had to go back to work. For the rest of the day, I conducted my other therapy sessions as usual, but my mind was unable to escape the thought of Phoebe and her poor daughter. 
and whatever ungodly thing was terrorising them. The end of the day came, and I was packing up my things and getting ready to head over to Phoebe's house. I was just closing up my suitcase, when my telephone rang. Hello? I answered. Doctor. It was my secretary. She sounded very worried. Phoebe is here to see you. I looked at my watch. Uh, send her in, please. Right away, sir. A few seconds later, a woman walked in. But it certainly wasn't the woman who had walked into my office a few days earlier. That woman was sharp and confident. This woman's long black hair had been completely messed and had several small grey streaks. Her face had been drained of colour and it wore a solemn and fearful expression. Her lips looked cold and chapped and out of them, the woman spoke. I saw him. I gazed at her but no words were spoken. I awkwardly motioned for her to sit, and then eagerly sat in my own desk seat. Phoebe slowly walked over to the chair, but she was clearly shaken. Her hands didn't stop moving the entire time she was in the office, and she kept glancing around the room as if expecting something to happen. She was majorly paranoid. After I got off the phone with you, she began, I decided to have a little talk with my daughter, so I brought her into the kitchen and sat her down at the seat that was directly facing mine. I asked what was going on in the past few days. She looked at me with a confused look, but her eyes knew exactly what I was talking about, and they couldn't lie. I told her that I knew something had been going on recently, and I was worried about her. She reassured me that she was fine and that there was nothing to worry about. I realized that if I wanted answers, I had to give her straightforward questions. So I leaned in real close to her and spoke softly as I asked her, What is going on with you and... Phoebe stopped and looked frantically around the room like a deer who hears a twig snap in the woods. She turned back to me and continued. Her and you know who. I nodded in understanding. She went on. Only I used his actual name. Apparently, when you whisper his name, he gets mad. Really mad. So, after I asked her, her face got very scared and she gave me a look that said, I am so sorry for what's about to happen. I would tell you to run, but there's no time. Phoebe began to breathe more heavily and was fidgeting more in her chair. Then this thing came at me completely out of nowhere and it just pounced on me. Phoebe paused for a long time. I, I can't even describe it. It was such an out-of-body experience. It's like I still have memory of it but I just can't think of anything to describe it with. But doctor, it was horrifying. As soon as it was over, I was lying on the floor, wheezing in pain. My daughter came running over to me, and she tried to make me feel better, but she couldn't. Not after what I'd just been through. I thought hard about this. And you can't describe it? Phoebe shook her head sadly. It would be like describing music to a deaf person. I thought again. I suddenly got an idea, but it would require a huge risk. I didn't know if I wanted to propose it or not, but while my mind was still deciding, my mouth made the decision for me. How about this? I started. You go home and try to summon Mr. Whisper again, but this time, I reached into my suitcase and pulled out my digital camera. Take a picture of it with this. I tossed the camera to Phoebe. May I remind you that you absolutely do not have to go through this if you don't want to. It's a good idea, 
she said, while still looking down at the camera. But I'm still afraid of what's going to happen. I got up out of my chair and walked over to her. That's perfectly understandable. I reached my arm out and put it on her shoulder. But if you do this and then come into my office first thing tomorrow with a picture, then we'll have conclusive evidence that this thing exists. Phoebe thought for a moment longer. Then, she slowly nodded. I'll do it. The next day, I got to my office about an hour early so I could meet Phoebe when she got there. I sat down at my desk and anxiously waited for her to arrive. I began to think about what I would do if she was successful in taking the picture. I would be able to see exactly what was causing all the trouble with Phoebe and her daughter. But what would happen from there? I thought about bringing in a priest or a demonologist. It might work. It had to work. As the hour slowly passed, my excited anticipation soon turned to raw stress. It came time for my workday to start, but there was still no Phoebe. I walked out to my secretary and told her to notify me immediately if there was any word about Phoebe. I went back to my office and started working with my other patients. My mind wasn't in my office though. My mind was traveling all around and the longer I heard no response, the faster my brain traveled. What have I done? I thought to myself. I've sent this poor woman straight to her doom. I should never have told her to take that picture. I should never have given her any advice about what to do. I should never have taken up this profession in the first place. I continued to beat myself up all morning. Then, almost as soon as one of my afternoon patients left my office, my telephone rang. I picked it up almost immediately upon hearing the first chime. Hello? I answered. As soon as I spoke, sweat began to form around my head. I was breathing so heavily that it could assuredly be heard on the other line. Sir? My secretary responded. She sounded almost as scared as I was. Turn on the TV. This was not the response I was expecting, but I still knew exactly what I would see on that TV when I turned it on. I slowly bent down and grabbed the small black remote off my desk. Which channel? I hesitantly asked. Any of them, she answered. I set the receiver down on my desk and nearly flinched as I aimed the remote at the small TV on one of my office's corner walls and pressed the power button. There was a reporter standing in front of a small suburban house. I don't remember everything she said, because I was mostly in shade at this point, but I could hear a general idea. While reports are still flooding in from neighbours about the horrifying sounds they heard from this house last night, there is still a large amount of evidence missing from this crime. Last night, at approximately 10.30, 37-year-old Phoebe Callaghan was attacked by something that is still unknown. The cause and the events of the brawl are also a mystery at this time, but what is known is that many neighbours nearby heard Callaghan's helpless cries, and many of them also heard a shrill, high-pitched screech that didn't seem to belong to any human or animal. When authorities arrived at the scene, they found Callaghan's body horribly warped and mutilated. Her once dark black hair had turned to a solid grey, and her eyes and face lacked colour. A small digital camera lay merely inches from her body. Callaghan is sadly leaving behind her seven-year-old daughter. I shut the TV off. I slumped all the way back in my chair and attempted to breathe. But every time I took a breath in, it wouldn't come out. I felt like I was suffocating. I tried to get up out of the chair, but I couldn't move. I was pinned. 
the world around me started to go blurry and dark. Dr. Martin! My secretary rushed into the room and quickly attempted to bring me back into full consciousness. Eventually, the world came into perspective again. I was able to comfortably lean forward and move around in the chair. I was able to exhale all of the air I was uncomfortably inhaling. Are you alright? She asked me, kneeling concernedly at my side. Yes, I'll be alright. I managed to say, in between my deep breaths, in and out. I can cancel the rest of your appointments today if you- No, I quickly answered. I'll see all of my patients today. The secretary looked at me, unsure. All right, as long as you feel up to it. But, I began. I paused for a while as I contemplated making this decision. I don't think I should be a therapist anymore. My secretary stood up, outraged at this. What? You can't quit. There are so many people who need you. Like Phoebe Callaghan? I reminded. She sadly sighed, deeply defeated. I don't think you should leave, but if you truly believe you have to, then I won't stop you. But I want you to think about it long and hard. I nodded slowly. Oh, she reached into her back pocket and handed me an envelope. The police came by this morning and dropped this off. They said Phoebe's daughter wanted you to have it. I inhaled deeply before taking the envelope from her. I thanked her before dismissing her back to her desk. Once she was out of the room, I stared at the envelope. I was absolutely dreading seeing its contents. I held it up to the light and saw the silhouette of a small black rectangle which took up about a quarter of the envelope. I knew it was a printed Polaroid picture of something. Before I could let myself say no, I tore open the envelope and slowly withdrew the picture from inside. The picture was blurry at best, and the camera seemed to be falling over as it snapped the scene, but the main focus of the photo was still very visible. Once I saw it, I completely froze up, letting the photo slowly drop onto the floor. As much as I've tried to forget all about this picture, it will never leave my memory. The image is forever burned into my brain. The right side of the photo seemed to be capturing a normal kitchen with a table and a stove in the background. But the left half of the photo showed a figure, dressed in all black, reaching directly for the camera with its long and hideous hands. The photo only allowed the viewer to see the torso and above. The hair on the top of its head was almost completely gone, but its scalp was old and had several cracks in it. On the side of its head, there were two large ears, almost twice the size of normal ears, and they stuck out of its skull like sore thumbs. But the most terrifying part of this beast was the face. Its awful face consisted of two empty, black eye sockets that still managed to stare directly at you. Just below the eye sockets was the creature's nose, and it was all crooked and terribly bent out of shape, like it had been smashed with a mallet. Then there was the mouth, if you even want to call it that. It was inhumanly wide open. No, it was completely unhinged from its jawline, which exposed several grotesque layers of teeth that pointed in every which way. If the creature closed its mouth, it would possibly puncture itself in several spots. When you stared directly at the creature, it seemed as though it was leaping directly out of the picture and right for you. It was merely waiting for you to whisper its name, and then it would wreak unspeakable havoc and pain onto you. This is why you must be careful when discussing this creature. You must be wary when it is around you. You must never whisper his name. Never whisper, Mr. Whisper.
I shouldn't have done it, I know. I shouldn't have done it. But the thing is, Matthew's more than just a son to me. The kid's one of my best friends. It's been like that ever since his mom passed away. Lately though, ever since he came back from university, a couple of weeks ago in fact, I've been worried about him. Really worried. Matthew's changed. University's changed him. And I don't just mean a flown the nest, more independent kind of way. I don't mean in a partying too hard kind of way either. I mean the kid looks ill. Seriously ill. When I picked him up at the train station, he had bags under his eyes that were like bruises. As though he hadn't slept in weeks. His hair was greasy. Even his breath was bad. Not my Matthew. When I dropped him off in Exeter all those months ago, he was a different person entirely. Happy. Excited. Not like now. Something happened to him down there. And in the days he's been home, it's only gotten worse. Over the past week, I've hardly seen him. He's out all day and home late. On a couple of nights, he hasn't come home at all. Told me he was staying at his friend's, but he didn't look me in the eye when he said it. This morning, he got up early and left just as I was getting out of bed. Said he was off down the park to meet some mates. He didn't look like he was going to meet mates though. He looked like he was off to face a firing squad. Anyway, I know all this doesn't excuse what I've done. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that when I went into Matthew's room after he'd left this morning, I saw that his laptop was on. Well, I only planned to take a quick look. Just something to set my mind at rest. Matthew's room is at the back of the house, overlooking the garden. As I sat down at his desk, a soft patch of morning sunlight spilled in through the curtains, lit the whole room up. It should have been pleasant, but it wasn't. It only highlighted what a mess the place was. Clothes strewn over the floor, dirty mugs, textbooks and paper spilling everywhere. The top left corner of Matthew's desk was covered in soil, which had been spilt from a pot plant his grandmother gave him. And there was a funny smell in the room too. An unpleasant mixture of laundry detergent, I had washed Matthew's clothes for him, old food and something else. Something I couldn't quite place. I wrinkled my nose and resolved to get out of there as quickly as possible. Then to have a proper talk with Matthew when he got home. Sit him down, ask him once and for all what was going on with him. In the meantime, I typed in Matthew's password, he's had the same one for years, and opened up Google Chrome. I navigated to history and hit Ctrl Y to show full history. The searches from this morning were Google, Twitter and Outlook, and I skimmed straight by those without reading them. I don't really know what I was looking for exactly, but I guess I'm a visual person. Rather than reading the text, my eyes were scanning the website favorcons as I scrolled down. The history wasn't too extensive, and I was already a few days back in time, when something made me pause. A collection of darker logos that stood out among the rest. Porn. Quite a bit of it too. From the looks of it, Matthew had spent that particular night browsing the stuff for at least a few hours. I stared at the logos and scratched the back of my neck. My skin suddenly felt hot. The light coming in from the curtains was making me squint. What was I doing here exactly? What had gone so wrong that I suddenly thought snooping through my son's computer was okay? The kid had browsed some porn a few nights ago. That was all. So what? He wouldn't be the first 19 year old to do it, and I very much doubted he'd be the last. So far, all I'd succeeded in doing was invading his privacy and making myself feel guilty in the process. No, enough was enough. I'd just have to have a sit down with Matthew when he got home. 
That was all. Parenting. The old-fashioned way. Before I went to close the tab, I scrolled back to the top of the history page. Force of habit, I guess. Thinking back now, I'm not sure what exactly it was that made me pause again. What it was that caught my eye. An unusual phrasing, maybe. A stray word that stood out among the rest. Either way, I suddenly found myself staring at a collection of Google searches my son had made the day before yesterday. Ones I'd missed before. And as I read through them, I felt a worm of unease stir in my stomach. 8.30 PM, the silent chapter, Google search. 8.46 PM, silent chapter initiation rituals, Google search. 9.32, what is scrying, Google search. 10.03, can I use scrying to open a portal, Google search. 1028, books of black magic spells, Google search. 1057, what is blood magic, Google search. There were other links in between those searches too. Wikipedia, email, a few websites that looked like obscure forums I didn't recognize. I'll admit it, at this point I was disturbed, but I wasn't that disturbed. I had already come up with an explanation for the searches as I was reading them. The thing is, Matthew's studying sociology at university. He's interested in different religions too, and he's always been fascinated by conspiracy theories. He loves all that stuff. Rereading those searches, I already knew what he was up to. Some kind of university project. That was all. It had to be. Matthew had become interested in studying witchcraft or the occult, something like that, and he was doing a bit of research into the subject matter, maybe even laying out the foundations for an essay. Or at least, that's the story I told myself, before I scrolled to Matthew's most recent searches, the ones he made this morning, the same ones I'd scrolled past at first, without reading them properly. Now I read them though, now I look closely at the text for each one. Follow the links too. Aside from some visits to Outlook, there were only three other items in Matthew's history from this morning, and by the time I'd finished looking at them, I felt dread in my stomach that was worse than anything I've ever felt before in my life. Even worse than the dread I felt when Matthew's mum was diagnosed. The first search was for a girl's name, Rosie Field. No one I recognized. I popped it into Google, but nothing much came up. Some LinkedIn profiles, a few Facebook and Instagram hits, nothing interesting. I assumed it was some girl he'd met down in Exeter. The second result was different though. This one was a Twitter link. I clicked it and it took me to a recent tweet from the local police. A photo they'd shared only a few hours earlier, not long before Matthew left for the day. The photo showed a little girl, young, maybe around seven or eight, big gap tooth grin, blonde hair in a ponytail, and one large word in red, just below her picture. Missing. Something in my chest tightened. My eyes flicked back to the text above the image. The girl had been gone since yesterday evening apparently. She'd been out to play in the garden and hadn't come back. She only lived a few streets away from us. Her name was Rosie Field. My hand was shaking as I clicked back on the history tab and stared at the final item, the most recent one. It was another Google search. 8.57 AM Best hiding places in a bathroom. Google search. I stared at it for a second longer, then followed the link, scanned the top few results, 
After a moment of staring at the screen, my eyes were drawn away from it again, over to the soil scattered across the top of Matthew's desk, the soil from his plant pot, the soil which he'd clearly spilled in a hurry and hadn't bothered to clean up. It didn't take me long to find it. I fumbled my hand into the top of the pot, digging through the dirt, and after a second of searching, my fingertips brushed something that shouldn't have been there. A small plastic bag, buried just enough so the top was covered. I fished it out. It was see-through, what looked like a sandwich bag, covered in dirt. I reached out with my other hand. My fingers were shaking so badly now, I could hardly hold the bag straight. But eventually, I managed to brush the soil off. I wish I hadn't. I wish more than anything that I had never gone into Matthew's room in the first place. That I'd never looked on his computer. There were only two items in that bag. Two small, but unmistakable items. The first was a miniature vodka bottle. It was filled to the top, but the liquid inside it was red rather than clear. It sat in the bag alongside the second item, a tuft of blonde hair bound together with an elastic band. I work at a restaurant. Same customer came in three days in a row. He had long, greasy hair, sunken eyes and a patchy beard. He wore stained grey sweatpants and a ratty t-shirt that celebrated Expo 86. He stood in line in front of me and ordered a small black coffee. One dollar fifty is your total. He fished around in his neon pink fanny pack and passed me a handful of change. I felt the clammy coins touch my hand, and I shuddered. He grinned at me, took his coffee, and found an empty table off in the corner. I leaned over to my co-worker. Have you seen that guy before? Gives me the creeps. She shrugged and went back to dipping churros and sugar. I helped the next customer, but I kept a watchful eye on the man in the corner. Maybe I was just being judgmental, but there was some indefinable quality about the man that made me uneasy. I noticed he didn't touch his coffee. Too hot, I presumed. Despite not ordering food, I could see that he was doing this intense chewing motion with his jaw. I watched as he paused, stuck his fingers into his mouth, and extracted a revolting masticated mass. Slick with saliva, it glistened in his hand. He then proceeded to stick this goop under the table. Gross, I thought. He was just finishing his gum. Then, I saw him reach into his fanny pack and insert a mysterious grey morsel into his mouth. He began the process again, grinding it up, working it out of his mouth into his fingers and depositing it under the table. I left the front counter and spoke with my supervisor. We have a policy about approaching customers who exhibit questionable behavior. Apparently studies show that members of the public are more responsive to well-dressed management types than us uniformed peasants. I told him about this creep and his gross habit. My supervisor shrugged and said, whatever, he'll be gone soon, just clean up after. I waited, and I watched the man repeat this obscene ritual. He left after an hour. My supervisor reminded me that I should clean the table, top and bottom, before the next customer complained. I brought out the bucket of cleaning supplies and begrudgingly walked over to his table. I went down onto my hands and knees and looked up. I had to retreat to avoid vomiting. There were over two dozen moist bundles of chewed up goo that speckled the entire underside of the table. 
I took out our chisel and managed to wedge them all off into a waiting garbage bag. After the first piece plopped into the bag, something struck me as strange. This wasn't gum. In fact, I had no idea what it was. I've scraped off plenty of gum, and its appearance and shape is overall pretty consistent. Gum looks like old caulking that comes out in all colours of the rainbow. In contrast, the mysterious gunk was dull grey and had the fibrous texture of chewed up steak. I finished cleaning up and tried to put this revolting chore behind me. The next day, at the start of my shift, I saw the man again. He was at a different table, and in front of him was another small coffee. Standing behind the till, I scrutinized the man's actions. Again, without fail, he stuck his fingers into his mouth, extracted the gnawed on mass, and placed it under the table. I swore under my breath. Store policy be damned, I was going to speak to this gentleman and tell him his behavior was unacceptable. I asked my co-worker to cover my till. I approached his table and saw his eyes light up as I drew nearer. He spoke first. Would you like some jerky? Excuse me? He reached into his fanny pack and removed a strip of meat. He held it up and waited expectantly. No, no thank you sir. We actually have a pretty strict policy on no outside food or drink. Really? He said. That's a shame. More for me then. He opened his mouth and I saw that he was missing all his teeth. He placed the jerky into his mouth and I could hear his saliva churn as he gummed the meat and swished it with his tongue. Sir, I need to speak to you about the stuff you're placing underneath the table. Oh, I am so sorry. I did not realize it was a bother. I will stop immediately. Okay, I said, feeling more a little embarrassed and grossed out. I began to back off from the table when he grabbed my wrist and said, I like you. I pulled my arm back and shuddered. I left the table, gave my hands a thorough cleaning, then went back to work. I didn't trust this man to keep his word, and sure enough, he continued depositing bits of food under the table. I saw him leave, and my supervisor encouraged me to go clean up. The table was worse than yesterday. It was like a star map of chewed up food. I grabbed the chisel and again removed the disgusting meat stalactites from the table. The next day, I'm returning from my break when I see the man again. He's at a different table and has a small cup of coffee in front of him. I resolve that there is no way in hell I'm going to allow this to happen again. I approach my supervisor and this time I am vehement. I threaten to walk out if he allows the man to continue this horrendous practice unopposed. My supervisor relents, says we can kick the man out as long as I'm the one that does it. He opts to remain in the back room while I do the confronting. I begin my approach, determined to put an end to this nonsense. I notice that beside the man, he has numerous grocery bags filled with economy-sized containers of salt. He sees me. Sure you don't want some jerky? No, sir, I spoke to you yesterday about the chewed up meats you keep putting under the table. I asked you to stop and you did not. I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Are you alone? What? No, sir, please leave. If you don't leave now, I'm going to call the police. He frowned, but did not get up. He pulled out a wad of jerky from his fanny pack and placed it in his mouth. Then, something fell out of his fanny pack and dropped to the ground. It looked like a large french fry. 
but at the tip there was the unmistakable impression of a fingernail. There was no doubt in my mind that before me was a desiccated human index finger. My jaw dropped and I met his surprised gaze. Such a shame, you would have dried up nicely. I ran before he could grab me. I barricaded myself in the back room and phoned the police. My supervisor hassled me for answers as I hyperventilated, trying to regain control. The police came shortly after. The man had left by that point, but given my description, they were able to pick him up soon after. Over the next few days, the police asked me many questions and provided few answers. A few months later, I got the whole story. Turns out, he was a forward-thinking, long-term cannibal. He wanted to find the best way to preserve his kills. Some technique that retained flavor without making the meat too tough. So, he innovated. He bought an industrial-sized dehydrator, chopped up his victims, and filled Ziploc bags full of people gum. The media referred to him as the jerky killer, based upon his love for spicing and drying his victims. Since he didn't have any teeth, he could never finish the last mouthful of fascia and muscle. Once the last bits of meat lost its flavor, it had to go somewhere. Under the table seemed like a reasonable place. Investigators had found he had placed pieces of his victims beneath the tables in over a hundred restaurants. Apparently, one of his favorite activities was relaxing with a cup of black coffee and chewing the fat of his old friends. I'm not the type to try and hitch a ride from someone else. If I can help it, I would rather just get to where I'm going on my own accord. When the engine of my car started to sputter its final breaths, however, it left me stranded. The particular stretch of road that my car decided to break down on was pretty removed from civilization. The nearest town in any direction is a 40 mile walk. Naturally, it was night. The type of night where you can see the stars dotting the sky, but you couldn't see seven feet in front of you. The dark wasn't what was crawling under my skin though. It was the rumors associated with the road, or perhaps the facts that created the rumors. Being such a long stretch of uninterrupted pavement, the road was a breeding ground for hikers. Not all who wandered this road would make the return trip home. It's estimated that around 70 hitchhikers would venture on the road and leave without a trace. Law enforcement eventually stopped investigating the disappearances and would assume anyone lost on the road wouldn't be making it back home. The most recent of these cases being Laurie Marlins, who was headed back home for the holidays. When she didn't show up to her parents' place a day later, they filed a missing report. She was a cute girl that looked good on missing posters, so people paid more attention than they would for the typical vagabond, none of which had commanding bright blue eyes and fiery red hair like she did. The rumors of some serial killer patrolling the road sprang up, along with more outlandish ideas, like aliens or mystical creatures from the forest the road passed as people tried to justify her disappearance. Never the type of superstition I have to admit that surrounded by a globe of darkness that stretched out forever, the rumors got to me. I decided it would be just as dangerous to sit by my car and wait for the morning to rescue me. If something was out there lurking, it was going to find me, whether or not I was walking around, so walk I did. The light tapping of my rubber soles on the hard pavement was the only source of noise other than the occasional cricket. Every time I would pass by a patch of turf that had grown particularly high, 
I could feel my body tense up for an impact that never occurred. As soon as I cleared each patch, the built-up tension would release in a heavy sigh. My breath swirled in the cool air. Whenever I pulled my cell phone out to see if I had received a signal, I was met with a red X in the upper hand corner, with the nearest city so far away. Towers would be an unlikely sight. I could have been walking for hours with little progress, each small and timid step barely distancing myself from the car, but with enough time, that too faded from sight. As I focused on the white line reaching out in front of me, I saw a faint glow pressing against the black top. My feet began to pick up a vibration as the yellow glow grew brighter and brighter. Turning around to face the source of the light, I observed a large truck barreling down the highway. I contemplated how I had likely only made it a few miles at best in a very extensive amount of time, and like I'd seen in the movies, I stuck out my arm. With my thumb pushed out as far as I could, the truck started slowing to a halt. My glee was immense. The thought that I was going to happily jump into a truck with a stranger wasn't even present. Trotting up to the door of the 18-wheeler, I waited for it to open. I could hear a rustle from inside the truck, and I bounced on my increasingly sore feet, trying to get a glimpse inside. As I was about to speak, the large metal door pried open and revealed the cab of the truck. A large and imposing man, shrouded by the night, sat by the driver's seat. That your car back there? His voice boomed from the cab. He had to speak up over the sound of the truck's various mechanisms still running. Yeah. I looked back in the direction I had come from. The darkness had a slight scarlet hue, basked by the brake lights. The thing just crapped out without warning. My arms were crossing my chest, as if it would fight off the onslaught of the chilled air. I could feel a vague warmth emanating from inside the truck, and I yearned for it. I'm not much of a car guy, so I'm just going to head to town. The trucker turned away from me and looked out the windshield. I could imagine his tongue clicking with consideration inside his mouth. He turned in his seat and shot a quick glance to the back of the truck. I could see it well, but it looked like there was enough room for a row of seats. A lot of folks go missing around here. Hop in, I'll get you there. His words themselves felt warmer than the heat escaping the truck. Thank you so much. I genuinely beamed as I watched him swipe a small pile of contents on the passenger seat to the floor. An odd array of different thumps as the objects hit the carpeting. I quickly glanced back towards the back of the truck, noticing the side of the truck was lacking a logo. The seams were also starting to form spider webs of rust on them. The driver must have sensed my apprehension. Another light from within the truck had flipped on. I ain't gonna hurt ya. He spoke, his deep southern accent soothing on my ears. I could see his face clearly when I looked back to him. He was a large and intimidating man, without a doubt. His face heavily covered by thick and dark facial hair. A beard that nearly reached past his chest, swaying as he talked, like blades of grass in gentle breezes. He was what I would imagine if I was told to picture a trucker. Flannel shirt over his large frame that could pass as a bear in the proper light. His voice, however, was disarming. The way he spoke reminded me of a parent trying to calm their rambunctious child. I gave him an acknowledging nod and put my foot on the first step. He quickly reached up and turned the light off before leaning towards me, with my foot still on the step. One thing, you are not to look in the back seat. The calming aspect of his voice had washed away and dried into a stern cadence, like if a drill sergeant tried to calm down the rambunctious child. I froze for a moment, but as he leaned back in his seat, 
I lifted myself into the cab. The urge to look into the back seat was pretty immediate as I climbed into the passenger seat. Even out of the corner of my eye, I failed to make out any detail in the back seat. There was only the mask of darkness. I pulled hard to close the door. It shut with a resounding thwack, as if someone had hit the door with a hammer. I don't know why, but I wanted the driver to think I was strong and capable of defending myself, so I closed the door really hard. He didn't pay any mind to it though. He just readjusted himself on the seat and pressed down on the gas, lurching the truck forward. Even though we were barely moving, I could feel the movement of the truck rattling my insides and clicking my teeth together. Watching out the window and doing my best to fight my curiosity, my senses began to pick up on my surroundings. The first thing I noticed is that the inside of the cab smelled absolutely horrendous. The heat was blasting onto my face, and while it didn't seem like the driver was an incredibly messy person, the stench of rotting garbage and iron wafting into my throat complied nausea in me. I didn't want to come off as rude, so I initially did my best to ignore it, but as the smell got to me more and more, I desperately wanted fresh air. My hand ran over the interior of the passenger side door, looking for a button or a crank, anything to crack the window. There was nothing, other than the handle I used to pull the door shut. The deteriorating leather texture was bare of any mechanism. More troubling than not being able to open the window was that I didn't even find a handle to open the door with, only a vacant divot where one once was. Doing my best not to jump to conclusions, or let on that I was internally becoming troubled by my escort, my breathing had to remain convincingly calm, so I continued to let the swill that hung in the air dilute into my lungs. Wanting something to focus on, I shifted in my seat and looked straight ahead, watching the white line flowing like water under the wheels of the truck. So... What kind of cargo do you transport? I asked. I figured I'd be more comfortable if we had a conversation started, and maybe I could gain information that would put my worries to bed. All the while, I was thankful that his rearview mirror was poorly adjusted, showing the ceiling of the cab. I wondered if he did that before I stepped in. I could momentarily feel his gaze wash over me, before returning to the road. Meat, he said in a matter-of-fact tone. Admittedly, that was the last thing I was hoping he would say. I was turning to face him when the headlights reflected off the road sign, briefly lighting up the cab. In a short time, I was able to catch a glance of the blue jeans he had on. More importantly, I was able to see the blotches of dark stains on said jeans. Dark red stains that glinted in the light, splattered like a Jackson Pollock on his ripped blue jeans. I doubted that a man like him was wearing fashionably torn jeans. It was getting harder to still my breath, and I had completely forgotten my attempts to make conversation with the driver. I appreciate the ride. I'd like to get out now, though. I attempted to say. My words were limping and shaking, my hand subconsciously reaching for the door handle that I knew wasn't there. We're not that far off. It'll just be a few minutes, he retorted. You don't want to get so close and end up missing like that poor Marlin's girl. His words felt like a house of cards in my head, like they'd fall apart in the slightest prodding. I don't know why. When I heard him saying the girl's name, I started to turn my head. My vision landed on him, but my head kept turning. My body reacted past my own will as I tried to peek at the back seat. Something shiny. I saw something shiny. My vision then went black as the driver socked me right in the face. 
my head flew back and bounced off the window. The punch wasn't hard enough to break my nose, but it was hard enough to make me turn away from the back seat. What did I say? The driver growled, his words becoming one with the hum of the truck. Keep your damn eyes forward. A bead of blood trickled out of my nose as I obeyed his command and tried going over my options. There was no way I would be able to overpower him, no way I could just reach over him to unlock my door so I could escape. So deep in my thoughts, I almost didn't hear the noise coming from behind my head. A soft and wet groan saturated the dry air. As soon as the noise began, it was muffled out by the radio. The trucker's massive hands turned the dial to the right as he glared at me, the whites of his eyes slicing my intentions in two. Through the blaring of some talk show radio, I could feel a pain growing on the back of my head and a buzzing that accompanied it. I darted my vision around, looking for anything I could use to my advantage. My feet felt across the carpet, thinking that maybe something he knocked into the ground would be useful. I tilted my head down, the soft glow of the radio barely illuminating the floor. I could see the green light falling on a length of rope. Like a call for help, whatever was in the back seat started to press hard into the back of my seat, sharp pressure points forming onto my spine. It had been so long since I had taken a breath. I hadn't even noticed that I'd stopped, but when I could feel fingers on my back through the seat, I let out a gasp and swallowed the stench. The heat and the smell had never been heavier than they were in that moment. The trucker once again didn't react. Both of us just stared at the road. We could both feel it creeping up. Out of the corner of my eye, she was leaning forward. The face of Laurie Marlins appeared in my peripheral, her wild red hair hanging ragged over her eyes. A panic swarmed over me and I reached down to grab what little rope there was, hoping I could contain the driver, but as I hunched over and turned to the side, I locked eyes with Laurie. Only the deep sea blue eyes I had seen on missing posters weren't there. Instead, I was peering into an empty cavern that resembled a hole dug through rock, the dark of which stretched on forever, just as the night did. Her face wasn't pretty and pristine. It was stretched out and clumsily held with wires onto a raw body that looked like it had been skinned. The drug had turned quickly and pushed the thing back, all while spouting expletives. It wasn't Laurie. It was wearing Laurie. The way the thing tried to fight the trucker was animal-like, and the shrill cries it gave off rose above the radio. I almost didn't hear the click in all the commotion. My door had become unlocked, and the handle be damned. I rammed my shoulder into it. I felt the heavy door move out a bit before being halted by the hatch that required the handle to move it. Something had to give though, and while I continued to pound my shoulder into the door, the trucker grabbed the rope from my hand, burning it in the process, and reached towards the thing in the back. The cab continued to rock as the pain in my shoulder grew to almost unbearable levels, but with gritted teeth I continued. While fighting back, the thing reached towards me and placed its hand on my shoulder, its wet and pulsing hand. When it was up close, I was reminded of slabs of meat I would see in the deli aisle. Its veins moved like worms and inflated as blood pumped through them. I could feel every detail through my clothing. This was enough to give me the motivation to near break my shoulder with one more assault on the door. With a hard impact, I felt something dislocate and then the door give way. The cool air rushed in as I crumpled out of the cab. Falling several feet, 
I met the ground, almost landing on my head, but managing to twist myself. Lifting myself to my feet, it became apparent that I wasn't able to lift my right arm with the immense agony clouding my thoughts. My left hand would have to do. I rose it up as hard as I could and slammed the door shut. The radio and the struggle inside the car were muffled by the truck's engines. Then, I heard a tapping. Faint at first, but as the struggle continued, it grew. Like stones being thrown at sheets of metal, I heard a chorus of tapping, until stones turned into a hailstorm. The source of the noise was the side of the logoless truck. Mindlessly, I walked along the side of the truck and listened to the commotion going on inside. It's estimated that around 70 people have gone missing on the highway within the last three months alone. At the moment, I was listening to the song of those missing people trying to dig their way through the metal. I continued to walk along with the truck until I found myself staring at the back. It was blanketed in chains and locks. The chains were rattling as the tapping started to sound against the back of the truck as if the things inside knew where I was. I heard another door slamming and it nearly threw me off my feet. I stared at the corner of the truck, waiting to see what would come around it. The tapping stopped, and the sound of one set of footsteps closing in on me was all I could focus on. My chest became lighter, and I heard the hard grunts of an overweight man that sounded like the huffs of a grizzly bear. He placed his hand on the corner of the truck and brought himself into view. He was sweating and covered in scratches. The brake lights covered the both of us in a deep red veneer. It was hard to see the blood oozing from his injuries in the light. He was breathing heavily as he stared at me, clearly trying to collect himself. They never go missing, he stuttered out through the exhaustion. I always find them. Make sure they don't find no one else. A few coughing fits decorated his speech. He looked up at the chain door and back to me. Don't know why, don't know how, don't care. He stated, almost as if he was mining my head for questions. I considered he was trying to save me from looking at the thing. Maybe he had just caught it before seeing me. It's eyes, I said, almost beyond my control. I couldn't get the image out of my head. I'd seen pictures of caves found in the forest, how the brown of the rocks would tunnel in until there was only darkness. How hypnotizing those places must be. How they feel like they're calling out for someone to explore them, to pay them attention. He took his hand off the truck and leaned back. I did the same to see what he was trying to look at. He was looking at the lights of the town. We must have been only about a mile out. I completely lost track of time and distance through the ordeal. Once one sees you, they all do, he warned. I thought of all the faces and vagabonds and weary travellers, how they were being worn like masks by the numbers, and that they were all looking at me from inside the truck. I gotta turn around, can't go into town like this. His breathing had become considerably calmer. I don't think he was exhausted from the struggle, I think his breath became riddled with frantic anxiety. I'll be okay, I replied. I wanted nothing more than getting to watch that truck drive far, far away from me. The trucker nodded and turned back to the cab. Thanks for the ride, I said. Empty words filled the night as he vanished around the corner. I walked back by the side of the truck and past the front of it. I continued walking along the road, 
covered in the silk touch of the yellow headlights. I heard the horn of the truck echo through the night like a trumpet of war. I turned the face of the cab and met eyes with the trucker. I lifted my arm and stretched out my thumb as far as I could see. The headlights dimmed and the truck drove through the grass to turn around. It only took me about an hour and a half or so to limp my body into town. I was thankful to find the mechanic before he closed up shop. He said he could help me in the morning and gave me directions to the hospital for my arm. I spent the night in the hospital being worked on. They popped my shoulder back into place. Couldn't feel a thing. I just kept thinking about those eyes when the trucker honked his horn and I turned to face him. I could see her eyes like they were only inches away. My vision tunneled in on them and they became all I could see before he started to drive away. Laurie Marlins now has the most alluring eyes I've ever seen. I didn't think learning to code would be like this. Switching from majoring in business to computer science halfway through college probably wasn't my best idea. But then again, neither was picking business to start with. Heck, up until tonight, I couldn't even program my thermometer settings. But here, in this cramped dorm room, with only the tiny desk fan and my roommate snoring to keep me company, I had finally cracked the case. My first Hello World program. I leaned back, letting out a sigh of relief. This must be what a fledgling hunter feels like when they shoot their first deer, or what a medical resident experiences when they first save a life. Not that I would know. I was going after a business degree for two years after all. I looked again, admiring my work, like I had just sculpted the most beautiful marble statue the world had ever seen, with the only illumination in the room coming from the screen, imprinted with my beautiful code. System.out.println Brackets Hello world! But, after grinding through my textbook, and my poorly written notes for the past hour with only my screen light looking like a dumb caveman, I felt like Albert Einstein. With a feeling of finality, I escorted my finger to my decrepit laptop's enter key. Before I even got the chance to feel nervous, those two gorgeous words manifested themselves in the console. Hello, world. I would have shouted with joy but I figured that waking up my roommate probably wasn't the best move. In my earlier college days, I probably would have made a cocktail to celebrate, but at that moment, all I could think about was a cold water. I guess I learned something in business after all. As I reached out of my chair for our mini fridge, just barely out of reach, my screen flashed in the corner of my eye. At first, I figured the screen was burning out on me, that computer was already unreliable, but I just couldn't bring myself to replace it, partly out of respect to the service it had done for me in the past few years, and partly because I had blown all my cash reserves and a few too many nights out in my stupider days. Seeing what actually happened to the computer jolted me out of my self-reflection. Bolting upright, I stared at the words that had just appeared beneath my beloved Hello World. Hello, John. I definitely hadn't typed that. Besides that, nobody has called me John in years. I've been going by my middle name since high school. As I felt my heart rate increasing, along with the urge to wake up my near comatose roommate, I utilized a technique that had helped me since the accident last year. I breathed out. There was probably a logical explanation behind the message. A prank, a glitch in the settings, or maybe I was just more tired than I felt. Despite the barrage of explanations my brain produced, none could seem to quell the worm of anxiety beginning to writhe around in my guts. 
I wondered if maybe I should have stuck with business after all. Just as I was about to close my laptop and call it a night, a new message flashed in the console. Talk with me, John. The explanation sank to the bottom of my head. Whatever was going on, we definitely hadn't learned anything like it in my programming class yet. As dumbfounded as I was, I knew it wasn't Java, and I thought it was unlikely to be an issue with my IDE. I leaned in close to the screen. It seemed like the only reasonable solution was to just ask. The clicking sound of the keys filled the room as I went to work. System.out.println brackets. Who are you? I slammed the enter key and the screen flashed again. I admire the efforts you've taken to improve yourself, John. You've come a long way in the last year, John. The mysticism didn't help me. I shuffled anxiously in my chair, unaware of how much I was craning back to read the text. As much as I wanted to turn off the machine, I had to keep going. I tried again. System.out.println bracket. What are you? A flash. An error. A mistake. Perhaps you could say a glitch in the system, John. The sound of my roommate changing position in his bed nearly caused me to fall out of my chair. I pounded on the keys. System.out.println bracket. What do you mean? I sat there, my hands hovering over the keyboard, my palms growing clammy. After a few agonizing seconds, the console flashed again. You lied about what happened last spring. Goosebumps all at once peppered my entire body. My mouth went dry. I almost called out to my roommate, but as I opened my mouth, no sounds came out. Instead, I turned around and went back to typing. My fingers moved by themselves. System.out.println bracket. It wasn't my fault. A flash again. You didn't have to lie. You could have and should have taken responsibility. You didn't have to drive that night, John. A strange mix of sadness, fear, and an endless volume of guilt infested my body. I could feel my head going light, and I grew unable to resist the chills working their way up my spine. The memories I'd spent the past year working through, the memories which led me to change who and what I was, slammed into me like a train. I sat, frozen, stunned by these words produced either from the code, my frantic tired brain, or perhaps a force I did not entirely understand. The console flashed again. You killed her, John. I threw the laptop against the wall, where it shattered with a loud crash. Unable to stop myself, I assumed the fetal position in the chair like a coward. I'd find a way to buy a new laptop. I might even find a way to work through the memories which lay dormant, coming out to assault me at unpredictable times. I'm not sure what the words from the console were. Hallucinations, maybe. I was typing frantically by the end. It's a wonder why my roommate never woke up. I unfurled myself from my position. I could still feel the heat of the tears in my eyes. I turned the chair around, about to make my way to my small, dorm bed, when I froze. My roommate was sitting upright in his bed. I couldn't make out his features well, with only the moonlight from the window barely illuminating parts of the room. The position of his body suggested he was directly facing me. The whir of the fan had ceased by this point, but I'm not exactly sure when. But, Brian? I stammered out. No response. Brian? I could hear the shuffle of his body leaning forward, his large body leaving the bed. 
I scampered from the chair, using the desk to prop myself upright. Bry, what are you doing? As he neared the window, I caught a glimpse of his eyes. They appeared glassy, like he had cataracts. He let out a grotesque, toothy smile. He opened his mouth, sensually and slowly breathing out. Hello, world. The two words, which I was so proud of only ten minutes ago, seemed to come from everywhere, encompassing my entire being for what felt like an eternity. An unstoppable tide of fear and self-loathing engulfed me as he said the words. I wanted to die. I felt like I was decaying away in that cramped dorm, my thoughts scattered and my brain broken. And then, I ran. I sprinted for the door, fumbling as I tried to unlock it. The Brian thing's steps growing louder and more intense behind me. I managed to undo the lock, running down the halls of the dorm in panic. The next thing I remember is heaving in the courtyard, the breath stripped from my burning lungs. I had apparently woken up some of the dorm, and a few of the guys there had followed me out. One of them, a freshman, thought I was high on something. I didn't go back to the dorm that night. Brian was never found again. The police questioned me about it, but they were never able to establish a concrete connection. They even did a drug test on me, but I've been clean since the accident. The laptop that I demolished seemed to have no abnormalities. The hardware, aside from what I had smashed, was fine. The same, unfortunately, cannot be said for Brian. We were never particularly close, but he didn't deserve whatever happened to him. Sometimes I think I see him out of the corner of my eye, but it's always just a trick of the light, like some kind of mirage. At least I think it is. While I would not consider myself a superstitious man, I do all my coding during the day now, and always in a public place. The constant paranoia since that incident only adds to the immense magnitude of grief, and I only hope that whatever that code was, and whatever happened to Brian, stays far, far away from me. It's 2am, I'm lying in bed, waiting for the day to start, so I can finally escape this nightmare. Once dawn hits, I'm jumping out of bed, running to the ops manager's office, and handing in my resignation. I'll explain to him that I can no longer work here, and thank him very much for the opportunity, but I'm seeking employment elsewhere. I'll pack my bags, leave this place on the next bus out to town. For the last five months, I've been working at Hillcraven Goldmine. It's a relatively small operation, but one that's been going on for over 200 years. I've been working as its surveyor, much to the dismay of my mother. I was originally supposed to study and become a software developer. After passing high school and getting my degree, alongside the hundred other kids who had the same idea, I'd spent most of my days sitting behind a computer monitor drinking copious amounts of coffee while typing code for hours on end. Luckily for me, a few bad marks on my final report card prevented that catastrophe from ever happening. As a result, I've become what is known as a third generation miner, as my dad likes to call it. He made his living as a mine surveyor, and his dad did as well. It was fate, really, that brought me to here. The work is tough, but I've found that the mining culture and the routine of work is extremely enjoyable. I've been living in a commune on site with five other men, provided to me free of charge by the mine. Eating meals at the cafeteria for pennies, and only going into town once a month for a whole week of drinking with my colleagues. The routine has created what I can only describe as a kinship between me and my co-workers. We eat the same food, 
work in the same conditions, and sleep in the same house. Every morning at 6.30 a.m. sharp, we wake up and make our beds, rubbing the sleep from our eyes and stretching out our stiff limbs. We walk out and join the other 100 people in the locker rooms. We open up our assigned lockers, get changed into our overalls and gumboots, grab our hard hats from the racks, and make our way to the lamp room. The lamp room is where you get the safety equipment required for going underground. The kit includes one battery-powered LED headlamp, which you attach to the top of your hard hat, an external battery pack that provides power to the lamp, which you thread through one side of your belt, and one small oxygen tank that you clip onto the other side of your belt. So far, no one has bothered to explain to me when I should use the oxygen tank, or even how, so I pray that I won't ever need to know anytime soon. Once you're kitted out, you make your way to the mine shaft. The shift boss will be waiting outside the lift with his ragged clipboard and leathery face. You give him your name and tell him which tunnel you're going to today, and he'll make a note on his list. That way, they see who's missing at the end of the shift and who shouldn't have gone in in the first place. The shift boss is also responsible for checking if you have the right equipment on. If you don't, you can't go in. Got your hard hat? Check. Headlamp working? Check. Earplugs? Check. Last on his list is your boots. He'll glance over his clipboard and give your gum boots a quick once over to make sure you have them on. Once he's checked that off his list, he'll give it a second check. If your gum boots have so much as a spot of dirt on them, he'll raise an eyebrow at you and give you a chuckle. Been working the night shift, hmm? He'd ask. All the fellow miners will laugh at that, having been asked the same question at some point. What? I asked the first time it happened to me. My boots mudded and hard hat perched awkwardly on my head. Your boots. The only people who have reasonable excuse to have dirty boots are the people who work the night shift, he replied. But we don't have a night shift, I asked, slightly confused. Exactly. Make sure you keep your boots cleaned, he replied, stepping aside to let me into the lift and looking back down at his list, checking off the next person's name. All the surveyors must also report to the survey office for a briefing on what parts of the mine you'll be surveying that day, as well as to fetch the equipment from lockup. Since I'm the only surveyor on the mines besides Mark, I have to lug the near 10 kilogram equipment by myself. Mark is nearing 80, has severe arthritis, and spends his days in his office, looking over the mine plans and watering his beloved fern. He retired over 10 years ago, hopping onto the solitary bus that takes you back to town once a week to live with his wife of 50 years. His plan was to spend his last good years with her, doing some gardening on the two-acre property that he bought in the 80s until he passed away, hopefully in his sleep. After spending a month living with her though, he hopped right back on that bus and begged for his job back deciding that he'd rather spend his last few years working away from home. His duties mainly comprise of checking my work and updating the plans when necessary. On occasion though, he'll grace you with one of his many pieces of advice that he's acquired through the years. Always keep both feet firmly on the ground while in the tunnels, don't want to slip and fall, he'll tell you as you pass him in the kitchen or... A sharp pencil is a sign of sharp work. One of his favourites though, that he never seems to grow tired of is, always check your headlamp before you go down. It's easy to get lost without a torch. You'll never make it back. I normally try to follow the advice he gives me. Most of it makes sense and has actually helped me at times. Thanks to him, I always check my lamp before going down. Mostly, just give it a cursory click on and click off while the lift takes me down to the right level. Yesterday, I was working alone in one of the quieter parts of the mine. It was an old shaft that they were looking at expanding, and it was my job to make sure they knew where they were going. 
while I was setting up the equipment, I stepped on something soft. I picked up my foot. It was lying on the floor, half buried by dust and debris. A small pocket book. Curious, I dug it out and dusted it off. Survey report. Mark Whittle, it said on the front, in neat block letters. It was bound by a green leather cover, slightly scuffed and warped from sitting in someone's back pocket. I chuckled to myself as I picked it up. He must have lost this back in his heyday, when he was still making his rounds. I thought it would be funny to show it to him, take a look through his old notes and laugh at how he'd lost it. I slipped it into my pocket and carried on with the job, forgetting about it almost immediately. Once closing came, I went back up the lift, locked up the survey equipment and said goodnight to Mark. I handed in the headlamp and oxygen tank and went to the locker room. It was there that I remembered it, as I was changing into my normal clothes. By that point, Mark was most likely asleep, so I'd have to show it to him the next day. My colleagues and I ate dinner in the cafeteria, playing a round or two of poker before ultimately moving back to the dorm. As I lay in bed, winding down and getting ready to sleep, I decided to take a look through the pocketbook, just out of curiosity. The first few pages were just random personal notes and things to remember, as well as some drawings of different tunnels, all of them labelled. I laughed at a few of them. The contrast between the old Mark I know and the young Mark in this book was startling. After a few more pages though, something caught my eye. A note was written across the page. If you're reading this, please send help. I'm trapped down here with no idea how to get out. I almost choked laughing at that. The Mark I know could probably navigate those tunnels with his eyes closed. There's no way he'd lose the exit. He must have been very young. I couldn't wait to show him this. We'll go through it together, most likely in tears, thinking about young Mark lost in the tunnels, getting found by a group of miners who probably never let him hear the end of it. I turned the page and carried on reading. This time, the page was full of text. He's numbered the date at the top. Day 6. It's almost been a week since I came down here, and none of the tunnels seem familiar. I've been walking upwards for what seems like hours now, with no sign of me getting closer to the surface. I was surveying tunnel B2L when my headlamp turned off. I stood there frozen for a second, and the darkness causing my muscles to seize up. I reached for its switch, flicking it off and then back on. The light flicked back on, luckily. But that was the least of my problems. I turned the page. For a moment, I couldn't believe what had happened. I wasn't in the same tunnel. I reread that line again, slightly confused. Did he mean that he somehow accidentally wandered into a different tunnel? Or was he just magically teleported into a different part of the mine? I'll have to ask him tomorrow. I wandered around for a while, calling out, hoping someone would hear me and tell me which section I was in. My equipment was missing as well, most likely left behind when I was taken here. After what felt like hours, I heard noises, what sounded like people digging further in. I had made my way towards it, still calling out, until I heard them stop and call back to me. I've been working here for over 10 years. I started as an ordinary miner, rubbing shoulders with everyone at some point, before getting promoted to chief surveyor. In all that time, I have never seen these men. I turn the page again. Day 9. These men have wild desperation about them. Some just keep hammering against the wall, 
ripping chunks out of it with wild abandon for days on end. Some just sit idle, making small talk, or just staring at the wall. They told me there's no way back up as far as they've seen. At some point, they worked on the mine, and their lamps did the same thing as mine. When they turned back on, they found themselves here, just like I did. The next few pages are filled with what looks like scribbles drawn inside a grid. They all start in the center square and stretch out until meeting back in the middle. Hundreds of little strands of stretching across the pages. After a while, I realized that they were maps. Day 10. They call this Night Shift, due to the fact that all their watches stick at 2am sharp. Mine's been reading the same thing since I got here. When I asked them why they were digging, they explained that no matter how far up or down you go, you end up back here anyway. So they decided to go sideways. I've been here a week, and to me, that sounds like a reasonable choice. Some of these guys have been here for years. Since I got to the night shift, I haven't felt the need to eat or drink. Sleep hardly comes, and almost seems to be more out of habit when it does. I've spent the week mapping out the tunnel system. There are hundreds of offshoots that all seem to end up at the same spot, no matter how irrational it is. Day 11 I think I've found something. A small stress seam at the end of a dead-end tunnel. It stretches from the floor to the ceiling, and is just wide enough to stick my pinky through. I can feel air coming from it, a small, erratic breeze that must come from outside. I'm turning back and finding the other guys to help me dig. This could be a way out. The next few pages were full of sketches of the tunnel wall. He labelled where the stress seam is, as well as the optimal spots to dig it out. I flipped through them, until I found another full page of text. This time, it looks like it was written with a shaky hand. There's no date on the top. They haven't stopped chasing me since we let them out. As far as I can tell, I'm the only one left alive. They were waiting on the other side for someone to break the scene. They look just like us. Same faces, same clothes, same everything. I've been hiding, but I think they've found me. I can hear them coming. They have a good sense of smell. I can hear them sniffing. The rest of the pages are blank. I turned off my torch and placed the pocketbook on my nightstand. As I turned to my side, something caught my eye. Fred was lying in his bed, his head turned towards me. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I could feel the hair on the back of my neck rising. He's been staring at me, his eyes wide and his mouth slightly open. My heart beat faster as I realized he hadn't blinked. I turned away from him, my insides going cold as I fought down my paranoia. My eyes shut. I took a deep breath and let it out slowly, trying to calm myself down. As I opened my mouth to take another, I felt someone breathing on the back of my neck. <laughs> 